This is Rohingya Weekly News. Today is Tuesday, 11th March 2014. I am Diane Ahmed. Medical gap threatens lives in Arakan. Nazir Ahmed is dying. It is the rasping, frightened eyed passing of a man denied even the most basic medical care. An undignified and distressing and he is condemned to suffer because his ethnicity means that he is refused fundamental human rights. But Nazir Ahmed is a prisoner in Ong Mingalar ghetto, an enclosed area in the center of the Arkan state capital Akib where just meters away from bustling town life and tourist sampling, the local seafood about 4,000 Rohingyas are trapped in an existence of hunger and misery. The Rohingya live here without access to health care, education or sufficient food. Armed guards and fear prevent them from leaving. As Nazir Ahmed lies on a thin bamboo mat on the wooden floorboards of his roughly constructed home, his two sons attempt to comfort him by stroking his head and soothing his convulsing limbs. Everyone in the house is aware that there is a state hospital just a few minutes walk away as well as a team of international healthcare workers nearby who would be happy to help the sick man. But the staff of Medicans, San Frontiers, MSF, the only Ingo that had been allowed access to Ong Mingalar and had been treating Mr. Ahmed since he suffered a stroke in early January, have been banned from working in the region by Burmese government. Tensions between the majority ethnic Arakan and the Rohingya, a minority group not recognized by the government, are so high these days that even if they could afford to pay the gods to let them out of Ong Mingalar, many Rohingya fear for their safety at the local Arakan run state hospital. People are frightened they will be attacked if they go to the hospital explained one community representative who said Arakan hardliners patrol the medical facilities grounds. He asked not be named for fear of reprisals. Nazar Ahmed's condition started to deteriorate in the days before the Myanmar Times met him in Ong Mingalar on March 5. Three days previously, residents with some medical understanding had urged his family to take him to the hospital in a bid to save his life. But like many in Ong Mingalar, they have no opportunity to work and could not afford the 10,000 cut required to pay the guards to allow him to leave. Before MSF staff were expelled from Arakan, they had facilitated the movement of patients who required the hospital treatment and had given them the necessary referrals so they could retrieve, receive treatment at Akyub General Hospital. By the time enough cash had been raised to get Nazar Ahmed to Akyub General, his family felt it was too late. They said they did not want him to die in a hospital where they believed the Arakan medical staff would mistreat him because he was Rohingya. We did not want to send him there to die, said his son Jamal Nasser. He displayed two notebooks with his father's name and age, 58, written on the front. The notebooks contained Nasser Ahmed's MSF medical notes. The first date recorded was January 7, 2014. There were no entries after February 28, the date MSF was ordered to cease operations in a move the government said was aimed at preventing further community conflict in the region. The decision to evict MSF at the end of last month came amid growing resentment from Arakan residents who claimed the organization was giving preferential aid to the Rohingya and government concerns that the Ingo's reports regarding Rohingya patients they had treated following alleged attacks against them were at odds with the authorities' accounts. The group had been working in the region for more than 20 years and had 600 staff operating in Arakan alone, providing vital medical care across the state. 
They were particularly important in remote communities as well as to those in the IDP camps who had restricted access to site services. Ingo's and UN organizations have expressed concern that local health authorities in Arakan, Burma's second poorer state, do not have the facilities to replicate MSF's services. However, the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Health, Uso Luenye, has insisted they do and that state health workers will also provide care for those in the Bengali, the term Burmese officials used to refer to Rohingya camps. He has also asserted the ban is temporary, though MSF sources say they have had no confirmation of that. Temporary or otherwise, any reinstatement will come too late for Nazar Ahmed and very probably for many other vulnerable patients in Arakan. Five days after the MSF ban had come into effect, as Mr. Ahmed lay dying, no one from the Ministry of Health had visited Ongwin Galar to ask about the residents' medical needs, according to village head Shri Zanong. In a tiny bamboo hut a few streets away from Mr. Ahmed's house, a mother showed off her new baby boy, born the night before without medical assistance. Other mothers soon gathered around to show infants they have been given birth to while surviving in the most meager rations. A tin can full of rice, full of rice a day to feed a family of nine, a few handfuls of homegrown watercress, and what little extra food they might be able to afford from what is put into the village by a truck that after the guards have been paid off is allowed to leave twice a week to go to a nearby market for supplies. There is little firewood left in the village, so residents have been reduced to cooking over burning rubbish that often produce toxic fumes. Sometimes we just have to eat the leaves from the banana trees, said Zorina Katu, 45. When young woman appears with twins, they are six weeks old but still tiny. They are lucky, their grandmother is a traditional midwife. But while the Ministry of Health insists that it can manage vaccinations for all communities without MSF's help, it remains unclear how, when and who will facilitate the provision of polio and other inoculations to these new Ongengalar infants. The elderly too fear for their future now that the Ingo has been banned. Mong Mong, 63, has diabetes. While village residents say MSF did not usually supply regular diabetes medicines in the area, the Ingo was able to do so in emergency cases. Asked how he feels about the MSF ban, U Mong Mong said, There's a lot of trouble because of the lack of doctors and treatment, and we cannot go out for treatment. I'm frightened I will die. The union government is aware of how banning a respected Ingo from Burma appears on the global stage, especially at a time when the country is doing its best to present itself as a fledgling democracy. While officials at the state level seem more concerned with appeasing Arakan hardliners who demonstrate in the streets and make online threats against international aid workers, those heading up the union government's response appear keen to show they are taking a balanced stance. During a visit to Akyab State Hospital on March 3, the Myanmar Times witnessed a police chief interviewing a senior medical official regarding allegations that a three-year-old boy who had been brought to the hospital from Ong Mingalar with breathing problems on February 26 had died five days later due to the mistreatment by medical staff. Police officers were later seen questioning nurses at the hospital. According to the policeman, the allegations had appeared online. Ongala residents said sources in the hospital reported that while the doctors there do their best, other medical staff are less than caring towards, caring towards Rohingya patients. It may or may not have been a coincidence that part of the investigation in the boy's death took place in front of journalists. According to Usul Luenye, 
who said he was not aware of the incident but would look into it, the government expected the decision to remove MSF would provoke rumors and allegations and authorities were ready for the Rohingya to test us. Under such circumstances, he suggested it was important that such claims be properly investigated. While allegations about the boys' mistreatment remain unsubstantiated, a European medical professional who visited the hospital around the time of the boys' death said he had been shocked by other treatment he had witnessed there. He said he had looked into an operating room and seen nurses suing up the badly slashed face of an elderly Rohingya woman from an IDP camp. Seeing that they were doing a rough job and using thick sutures, he had asked why they weren't using finer thread on a face wound, and offered his own supplies if necessary. The response he received, he said, was that it doesn't matter. She has no money, she's a woman, and she's Muslim. In attack, it acknowledgement that Arkan medical staff might not always be the best people to treat the Rohingya population and might find it difficult to work in the IDP camps, Usol Winye said a rapid response team comprised, comprising medical staff from other parts of Burma was to be drafted into the region. However, he said it was expected to be deployed for only one week or two with state officials suggesting that it is likely to be at least seven months before MSF will be allowed to resume operations in Arakan. The future for Rohingya healthcare remains bleak. They will have to go without care or, if they can find money, put themselves in the hands of medical staff they do not trust. As the Bear Myanmar Times left Ong Mingalar, village head Sri Zan Ong made this plea. I would like to ask the union government if they will substitute another ingo to bring us medical treatment. It does not seem too much to ask.